everyone has a story. It's the unique narrative of your life that only you can tell. Some of the story you love, some of it you might wish was different, but all of it points to a greater reality. And when we look closely, we can see the fingerprints of God and the storylines of our lives. We can recognize how he has been at work and is still at work. We can see how he saved and restores and heals and fills us with hope for the future. This is the power of story. Well, good morning, BCC family and all who are joining us for today's broadcast. We begin this second Sunday of July with a call to worship from Psalm 28. It says this, beginning in verse 6. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exults and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. It's an incredible picture that Scripture portrays for us of Christ actually bearing us up as sheep on his shoulders. This is a picture for you today. That God has you, no matter what your week's been, whether it's been the best week of your life or the worst week of your life or somewhere in between, Christ bears you up on his shoulders. He carries you. And he is carrying you through this day, this week, this season of your life. He carries you to restore you. He carries you to heal you. He carries you to assure that you will indeed make it home. Welcome to worship today. Let's lift our voices. Let's lift our hearts in songs of praise to our great God. Let me invite you to stand right now, right there where you are in all of our respective locations and pray with me as we prepare to lift our voice in song and give our attention to God's word. Pray with me if you would. Lord, thank you. You are our strength and our shield. God, I I wish we had eyes to see in the spirit realm how much you are actually shielding us from, how you tangibly protect us day by day by day from the assaults of the enemy. And so God, today, Would you meet us in this time, in this worship service, through this medium of a recorded service? Would you meet us? Would your spirit come and speak through the the computer screen, the TV screen? Lord, through whatever medium utilized, would you use it? And would you speak? Would you accomplish your perfect will for our lives? that we might know that you are the shepherd that bears us up on your shoulders and carries us home. Thank you for the truth of this picture. Thank you for the validity of the imagery of you as our shepherd. We thank you for this. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's lift our voice in songs of worship to our God. The highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. The sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. 
My father's house is a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. The sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Oh, yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Who the sun. I'm a child of God, yes I am, in my Father's house, there's a place for me, I'm a child of God, yes I am. Grace that flows like a river washing over me. The fount of heaven, love of Christ overflowing me. Thank you, Jesus. You said, Christ my Savior, you rescued me. Take this life delivered, a vessel of your love. Holy now, dear. Thank you, Jesus. You 
set me free Christ my Savior you rescued me thank you Jesus you set me Christ my Savior, you rescued me. There's no one like you, Lord. There's no one like you, Jesus. Good morning, Bedford Community Church, and welcome to our Sunday worship service. I'm Jalissa, and this is the week's announcements. Our youth group and leaders are on their way back home from the Life Conference in Orlando, and they had such a great time. In the next couple of weeks, they will be sharing about their experience. We want to thank you all for keeping them in your prayers. You're invited to join us for our next Family Table Talk with NAMI. NAMI is the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization dedicated to improving the lives of millions of Americans affected by mental illness. We have four ways to give at BCC, online at bedfordcommunitychurch.org, on our Tithely app, through the mail, and in person when you attend services. We are so glad you're here with us today. Enjoy the service. Good morning again, BCC family, and all of you who are joining us for today's broadcast. Today we continue our July sermon series entitled, The Power of Story, 
testifying to God's work in your life. So this series is intended to launch us in the heart of the church's vision for 2022 and beyond. And that is to be a church that embodies in both word and deed the grace of Christ is portrayed through the gospel. Many of us struggle to share our faith, admittedly, and even to explain what the gospel actually means. In this sermon series and the ones that follow in 2022, our church community will be equipped with practical, tangible instruction on how to effectively share our faith and testify to God's work in our lives. Our goal is to create a culture of gospel literacy at BCC that centers our focus on mission reaching Northern Westchester and the surrounding areas with the hope that is found in Christ alone. Now, if you've done any research on the most effective way to share faith in the context of our current culture, you'll know that the most effective medium is through story. Now, this is not a new phenomenon. Jesus told stories, known as parables, all the time in his earthly ministry. And the most powerful way to articulate our story is to understand and to be able to speak through the overarching story of God and how that has fleshed out in our lives personally. Through this series, we will walk through four different themes of God's narrative in our lives. Jesus as our Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, and Coming King. Well, yeah, you'll recognize these four themes because they comprise the fourfold gospel held as foundational in our denomination, the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And we will learn to see the threads of these realities in our story while developing our ability to craft and tell our God story in ways that will draw others to see God in their story. We continue our series today with Christ as our sanctifier and identify the power of redemption as we are transformed by his restoring power. Today, we look at one of the most beautiful stories of restoration in the Gospels, the woman at the well in John chapter 4. So let's go there now. Pick up your Bible with me and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. I'm just going to read a brief section of this. It says this from the English Standard Version of the Bible, beginning in verse 35. Do not say, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Do you not? Sorry, go back and do that again. Mess, totally mess that up. Do not say, do you not say. It's not good when I leave out words. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. This is the word of God. Pray with me if you would. Lord, we give you thanks for the fact that you restore us. You bring us back to a, a place of healing and wholeness. You draw us close to you. You help us in the midst of all that we're experiencing. And so God, I pray that you would help us today. We want to be restored. In the same way that we see the restoration of the woman at the well, we want to experience this. And then we want to see the narrative of your restorative hand in our lives be shared with others so that they too might experience your restorative work. God, this only happens by the work of your Holy Spirit. And so come now. During this time, during the, the preaching of your word, that the word of God would not return void and take an imperfect man with imperfect thoughts and imperfect words to declare your perfect truth by the power of your Holy Spirit in conjunction with your eternal word. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Last week, uh, as some of you know, I had the privilege of joining a group of high-level pastors from across the nation for a five-day retreat at a ranch in Montana hosted by the Refuge Foundation. 
The express purpose was for these lead pastors to gather together for a week of restoration that awakens our souls and strengthens our resolve in ministry. Interestingly, they got us outdoors, fly fishing the Bighorn River and hunting small game on a large ranch in southern Montana. At night, when all our defenses were down and we were tired, we would sit around the campfire and talk about the challenges of ministry, about the wounds that we carry, about the places that we need God to restore us. I came back with many things that God did on this trip, but by far the greatest thing that I came back with was a framework for, I believe, how God brings transformation, restoration, really, to people's souls. For a long time, I've been working through the cutting-edge trauma treatment known as IFS, Internal Family Systems. Developed by Dr. Richard Schwartz, it has been a groundbreaking treatment for people living with the reality of trauma in their lives. While on this trip, a well-known pastor and I sat for nearly three hours unpacking IFS through a Christian lens, and especially how it helps us as individual men as we journey on the road of sanctification. Here's a snapshot of what we came to that was so groundbreaking for me personally. IFS summarizes that we all carry trauma in our minds and in our bodies, and trauma causes the fragmentation of our persons. These parts take on particular roles that help us manage life through the lens of the trauma that we've experienced. And it's this fragmentation, this dissociation, as it were, that causes so much of the pain that we experience in our daily lives. Simply put, it's hard to feel put together when we are, on the inside, shattered people. The process of sanctification is defined as the daily work of God in our lives and transforming us into the image of Christ by the work of His Holy Spirit. While this statement is true, those are some pretty big churchy words, aren't they? But what is really far more beautiful and simple is this. Sanctification is the process through which God reintegrates our broken parts and restores our fractured selves into the wholeness that He intended when He created us. The breakthrough I had in Montana is this. I I saw a model for how God actually operates in healing our souls. He invites us to the table, all of our parts, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, or at least that's how we view them. And he reminds us the entirety of them were created in his image and likeness, and he's restoring us back to that original beauty, that original integration. In fact, the Hebrew word shalom that Jesus uses to describe what he gives to us is not just a word for peace, It's the word for wholeness, shalom, the complete restoration and reintegration of all our parts. This is what Christ offers. And most people that are here today in this service today, the vast majority of the people around the world have no idea that we're even in need of this type of restoration. That's why the story in John chapter 4 is so very powerful. Jesus gently and expertly walks a broken woman through the reality of her trauma and then leads her to a place where she again finds hope and healing. She's confronted with her own devices to manage her trauma, and then finds that the God who created her has come to her to provide a real and permanent solution for her pain. That's what Christ does. And it's my prayer that as we walk through this story today, you'll see yourself in the story, and you'll learn to testify to God's restorative power in your life. Our text today is the Gospel of John chapter 4. Join me there now in your Bible as we begin in verse 1. The first section reads like a story. It's long. And so we'll go through the majority of the story and then go back and highlight the work of Christ throughout. It says this, beginning in verse 1. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea, and departed for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. And so he came to a town in Samaria near Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, 
You have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one that you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. Now there's so much here, right? Far more than we could ever unpack in one sermon. Let's just take a look at a couple of highlights from 36,000 feet, shall we? First, the entire story is laden with problems. What's the woman doing at the well in the heat of the day? Well, scholars believe that she's there because she's a social outcast, that she's been shunned by her context because she has had many husbands and now she's with someone that's not her husband. But before you judge her and label her as we so commonly do in our society, recognize that we have no idea of her story. Remember, women in Jesus' day were chattel, property. They had little to no rights. And so her situation could be that she was victimized and fled from abusive men, not that she was just a harlot who kept running from man to man. In fact, most commentators believe that this was not the case. She's a woman that's had to endure much trauma, and life does not hold out much hope for her. Enter Jesus. Problem number two, what's he doing there in Samaria? And why on earth is he speaking with her? He shouldn't even be conversing with her because Jews hated Samaritans and Samaritans hated Jews. So the entire picture of this story smacks of irony and impropriety. But God is not concerned with the social structures of man. He has come to bring abundant life and that's just what he offers the woman in the story. They open the conversation talking about water and both of them speak in allegory. Did you notice that? Jesus refers to himself as the living water and the woman slyly stating that he has nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Could it be that she was referring to herself, her own soul, the, the depth of the well of her own pain and trauma? It's really that way with all of us, isn't it? I mean, when we pull back the curtain, most of us feel broken, far too broken to be fixed, too marred to be restored, too shattered to find all the pieces, let alone put them all back together. But that's exactly what Christ does here with this woman. He sees her, all of her. All of her past, all of her parts, all of her broken pieces, and in compassion and deep love, he helps her look into the abyss of her soul with the assurance that his living water can wash away all the pain and trauma that she carries with her every day. Look at verses 16 and the verses that follow. He identifies her pain, and then he invites her to face it and be honest about it. He doesn't expose her, he sees her. He cares enough to sit with her in the pain. And in verses 19 and 20, she changes the topic from her pain to religion. Isn't that what most of us do? We would rather talk about theology than the God that heals our trauma. We would rather discuss God intellectually than let him have access to us emotionally. We would rather think about God's law than experience God's grace. Why? Because experiencing God's grace requires vulnerability. And the last thing that we want is to be vulnerable. Because if we're vulnerable and let people see who we really are, all of our broken parts, well, then we risk rejection. And this is the beauty of the story. Jesus sees this woman in all of her brokenness and makes her feel safe enough to let him in. 
Finally, he heads her off at the pass, and in all of her religious ramblings, she sums it up with this. When Messiah comes, he'll make everything clear. He'll make everything right. And then Jesus reveals himself to her as just that Messiah. Isn't that what we need today, friends? For so many of us, Jesus is right here in front of us, and we're still waiting for someone or something else to save us, something to heal us, something to restore us. He, he sits right before us and says, all that you need is right here. I am he. It's important that you remember something, that before you and I make the offer of abundant life through Jesus Christ to the people around us, we first need to experience it ourselves. We can't point people to a healer who hasn't healed us. We can't evangelize people by introducing them to a Savior who hasn't saved us. Well, just as things are getting good, the disciples show up. They kind of interrupt the whole thing, and they're sitting there bewildered by the scene, just like the rest of us. Pick up the text with me at verse 27. Let's see how this finishes out. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? But Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. The picture that this text presents is that of true gospel ministry, the authentic proliferation of the gospel. The food of Jesus is to transform lives. This is indeed why he came, that we might be restored. Abundant life offered, fully reconciled to God. So a person meets Jesus, the God who created them, the God who sees them, the God who knows them, the God who restores them. And that person, so utterly transformed by this encounter, shares the wonder of this experience and brings other people to meet him. That's what happens in the text. And those people, having met and heard him personally, having been touched and transformed by him personally, now share that truth, the good news, with others. This is how the gospel has spread throughout the world over the last 2,000 years. And this is how it continues to spread today. This is the essence of outreach. This is the purpose of you telling your story. But before you tell your story, you have to have a story. And this is where God's work of sanctification, God's work of restoration happens in your life. You can't fake this, church. This is where the rubber meets the road. Because if, if Jesus isn't real in your life at present, if he isn't transforming you day by day, if you've lost touch with the presence of God in your life and experience, then it's very difficult to testify to the wonder of God's love and grace and restoration to the people around you. That's why the story of the woman at the well is so profound and one of the most beloved stories of the Gospels, because it's a picture of how God works, how he enters in how he sees us and loves us just as we are, regardless of the labels we carry. Think about her labels, woman, Samaritan, harlot, unwanted, outcast, unloved, unseen. Jesus came for just these types of people. And he came to see them, to embrace them, to welcome them, to, to tell them that they belong to the Father. Stories like this always get me. They, they remind me of my story. Like many of you, I, I felt like I never fit in. I, I felt like I never had a place at the table. I always felt like an outcast. You might say, you, Pastor Josh? Yes, me. See, we all have trauma. We all have a past. We all have a story. And the glory of God is to rewrite restoration and healing over the pages of your past. 
as we will do throughout this series, here's a testimony from someone who has experienced this restorative power of Christ and is being made daily into His image through the process of sanctification. Listen to this God story and see yourself in the midst of it. Um, I couldn't help it when they asked for testimonies to give just a little synopsis of my life. As a young child, I, I went to a church every Sunday with my girlfriend, you know, my friends in the neighborhood. All the parents stayed home and all the kids went to school. And I learned about a holy, mighty God. I didn't quite get Jesus. And there was some trauma in my home where my sister left home and was pretty much, I was 11 and I cried for years when she was gone because it was almost like she died, but she didn't. But she just found something else, a faith that divided us and my home was divided and there was a lot of unforgiveness. So I cried out to Jesus at a young age in my, twi in my teens because I needed hope. I knew a lot about the world as far as <laughs> school and everything I read and it scared me and I wanted hope. Especially it was during the war and there was a lot of pain. Um, and you know, there's a verse that says, if we diligently seek him, we will find him. So I met someone and in my journey, I thought I'd become Jewish, but in my journey, I found somebody who loved the Lord and she would just in, had me for lunch and we studied John. And I remember me, reading John 3 the first time and finding that, well, yeah, of course I would want what Jesus was asking Nicodemus. I would want to be born again. I would want to walk with him and, and I would have a Holy Spirit to guide me. It was very appealing. It just made sense. And then I want, I, not only did I want hope, but I wanted unconditional love and forgiveness. I had promised myself as a young woman that I would never hold a grudge and never not talk to somebody. And I were, I've, that has been a motto of mine for years. I would have walked with, I have sat with people to work out stuff because it just hurts my heart to think that people would stop loving one another or cutting off each other because of that. So in, those tw in my 20s, I learned God's unconditional love. In my 30s, some anger came out. He's a li it's a living, walking relationship. And in my 30s, when my anger came out, the Lord said, I will work this out with you. And I started going for counseling. And thank you, Jesus, that I found that unconditional love and, it, and the honesty of how God loved me totally. And I no longer just had it in plateaus or different weekends or be, bits and pieces, but I, I learned to know that I was loved fully and unconditionally. So as I've walked through my life, I've had some real pain, but I've learned that God is faithful with my children, with losing a child, a man, a young man. God has shown his faithfulness over and over again. And healing has come and his presence has come. And I just encourage you not to be afraid to let him in, not to be afraid to let him walk with you. This life is tough. Give him a chance if you're, if you're on the fence. Give it a try. He just wants us to step out there. He wants a relationship with us. He's a living, breathing God who loves us every step of the way. And our life continues and we learn in so many different ways. Allow him in and let him heal you fully and love you. Just love you. I love stories like that. I know you do too. It reminds us that we're not alone and that what God is doing in others, he's faithful to do in us. Let's remember this church. Let's lean into the healing available through Christ's finished work at the cross. And then let's share unashamedly this story of restoration with any and all who will listen. Pray with me if you would. God, we give you thanks and praise that you meet us 
that you come and find us, that you, that you go into seemingly enemy territory and you wait for us to show up. We show up with our, our shame and our frustration, with our fragmented lives, and you speak to us and you minister your healing. God, I think that the tendency for so many of us is to say, well, I, I don't know what Pastor Josh is talking about. I'm not that bad. But God, for so many of us, we don't know what we don't know. We don't comprehend the depth of our need. And so would you pull the veil back? Would you show us the props that we use to hold ourselves up, to make ourselves feel better about our lives? Would you kick away all the crutches that we stand on to to lift ourselves higher? And would you show us that we are absolutely nothing without you? And then would you show us that you're right there, inviting us, saying these words, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God, we want to experience that rest because that rest is really restoration. Would you do that? Would you do that today in the hearts and minds and lives of my brothers and sisters? Supernaturally, God, we seek you now and we ask for your restoration to happen in our lives, that it would really happen and that we would be transformed so much so that people would look at our lives and want what we have. We thank you because all of this comes from you and all of it comes through grace. We receive it now. And we give you thanks and praise. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let me invite you to rise right where you are. And let's sing this closing song of worship to God as we worship him and honor him today for his restoring work. Behold the Father's heart. The mystery he lavishes on us As deep cries out to deep How desperately he wants us And the things of earth Stand next to him Like a camp to the sun Unfailing Father, what compares to His great love? Behold His Holy Son, the Lion and the Lamb given to Became a man that my soul should know its savior. Forsaken for the sake of all mankind, salvation is in his blood. Jesus, Messiah, for the righteous died. Love. It wasn't over for his the risen one. Then sings my soul. Then sings my soul.
Watch as the clouds he rides swing low. Lift up the sound as he makes our praises flow. 